Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is paper 6, November 2021, uh, in the Cambridge IGCSE chemistry syllabus. Uh, let's take a look at the questions. The first one says, hot concentrated hydrochloric acid reacts with solid manganese oxide to make chlorine gas. Chlorine gas can be dried by bubbling it through a liquid drying agent. The diagram shows the apparatus used to make and collect the sample of dry chlorine gas. There is one error in the diagram. Name the items of apparatus labeled X and Y. You should know basic for paper 6. Please learn the names of the apparatus. So, of course, X is a conical flask. If you just write it flask, that's okay. Y, of course, is a gas syringe. Name the substance labeled Z. Well, let's go up to the uh, question and see what he was adding. He was adding a uh, hot concentrated hydrochloric acid to solid manganese oxide. So obviously Z is the solid reactant, so that would be the manganese or oxide. Then he says on the diagram draw one arrow to show where heat should be applied. So he was saying he wanted to have hot concentrated hydrochloric acid react with solid manganese oxide so where should i heat remember i heat in the flask that is doing the reaction not in the other flask and we draw an arrow pointing upwards and we write here there is one arrow in the way the apparatus has been set up on the diagram draw a circle around the error in the apparatus what is wrong with the apparatus you should look at the second flask the one in the middle if I have delivery tubes going into a flask, one should be going into the liquid, but the other one should not be inside the liquid. The delivery tube going out to the gas syringe should be out of the liquid, not inside the liquid. So that is the error. Now describe what would happen if the apparatus is used as it is before the error is corrected. So as it is, if we allow it to react, it will give out the chlorine gas. The chlorine gas will bubble into the liquid drying agent. This will push the liquid out through the delivery tube into the uh, gas syringe. I don't want that. I want only the chlorine gas to go into the syringe, not the liquid drying agent. So as it is set up, the liquid drying agent will be pushed out of the flask into the delivery tube and the gas syrup. The second question says, a student investigated the temperature change when zinc reacted with two different aqueous solutions of copper sulfate. So Q and R are different solutions of copper sulfate. Two experiments were done. The first experiment, he put a polystyrene cup into a beaker for support using a measuring cylinder he put 25 centimeter cubed of solution q into the polystyrene cup and then he measured the initial temperature he added three grams of zinc powder and he started a stop clock and he measured the temperature every 30 seconds and he's telling me that for this experiment the initial temperature was 23 degrees celsius so, of course, if you want me to measure a temperature change, it would be the final minus the initial. So, let's take a look at these. We said when we are reading thermometers, it is to one decimal place. So, these are the readings that you should have. Do not try just 43 and then at some point we want to write 49.5. If it is going to be 0.5, then the other ones have to be 0 0.0. Temperature change means I'm going to subtract 43 minus the initial, which he says is 23, and so on. So this is the temperature change for experiment 1. Remember experiment 1, he was doing zinc with a solution of copper sulfate, which he called Q. Now in experiment 2, he says the polystyrene cup was washed out with distilled water. Experiment was repeated but using R instead of Q. Here in this experiment, the initial temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. So, again, we're going to um, read 
the temperatures from the thermometer and then subtract these numbers minus 24. So these are my temperature changes. And then he says complete a suitable scale on the y-axis and plot the results from experiment 1 and experiment 2. So we should, for example, remember that we need to use as much of the graph paper as possible. So this would be a reasonable one in which you have 5, 10, 15, 20. And you plot the first curve. Here we're supposed to draw two curves. So you draw the first curve, plot the points with small x's, and then you join it before you go on to the next experiment. Remember to label your curve. So this is the curve for the first experiment. And then I plot. If one of them is x's, then the other should be a dot with a circle. So that would be my second experiment. He says draw two curves of best fit. And both curves must start at zero. So please follow his instructions. Then he says, from your graph, deduce the temperature change at 110 seconds in experiment 1. So I look at where is 110. I go up to experiment 1, go horizontally. I find that the temperature change in this case is 29.0. Remember, it is what you have in your graph. So he will follow your graph and see what you're supposed to get from what you do. Predict the temperature of the solution in experiment 2 after 5 hours. Usually he says, okay, I did the experiment, the temperature went up or the temperature went down, I leave it and go back after 5 hours, what would be the temperature? You should realize that after the experiment finishes, the temperature will go back to the initial room temperature. So here the temperature will go back to 24 degrees Celsius because the reaction is finished and the temperature returns to what it originally was, which is the room temperature. So just why the experiments were done in a polystyrene cup rather than a glass beaker. Again, we said if we're doing an experiment in which we're measuring temperature, we should do it in a polystyrene cup because the polystyrene is insulator, so there will be less loss of heat to the surroundings. Describe how the results will be different if a glass beaker is used. Remember, he's saying, describe how the results will be different. So that means describe how the temperature change would be different. If we're using glass beakers, then there will be loss of heat to the surroundings, and that, that means the temperature change would be lower than what it should be. So just one change that could be made to the apparatus that would improve the accuracy of the results? Well, again, we go back to the experiment. We find that he says what? He used a polystyrene cup. Good. That's good. That's what we're supposed to use when we're measuring temperature. But then he said using a measuring cylinder, he measured 25 centimeter cubed of the solution. You should know that we are not supposed to use a measuring cylinder for that. We should use a pipette because that would give a more accurate volume. Then the next question says solid S and solid T were analyzed and the tests were done. Now test one, he says solid S was placed in a boiling tube. 10 centimeter cubed of dilute hydrochloric acid was added. This gave effervescence, which means bubbles of gas. Now you ask yourself, dilute hydrochloric acid alone is a test for what? If I add dilute hydrochloric acid to something and it gives bubbles of gas, then I have carbonate. Then he says the solution formed in test one was decanted and the solution is solution U and he added aqueous sodium hydroxide dropwise and then excess. What did he get? He got white precipitate insoluble in excess. You ask yourself, what would give you white precipitate insoluble in excess when you add aqueous sodium hydroxide? You should know that that is calcium. And that means what I have is calcium carbonate. So the gas given off in test one was carbon dioxide gas. 
describe how the gas could be tested. What is the test for carbon dioxide gas? You should know. Bubble the gas through lime water, it turns milky. So what was the solid? We said it has calcium and it has carbonate. That means my solid is calcium carbonate. Then he has solid T was iron 3 chloride. So you should uh, remember that solid T has iron 3 and it has chloride. So the, to the first portion of solution T, um, aqueous sodium hydroxide was added dropwise and then excess. What do I have? I have iron 3. What happens if I add sodium hydroxide? You should remember that if I have iron 3 and I add sodium hydroxide, I should get reddish brown precipitate insoluble in excess. Because he's saying I added dropwise and then excess. So dropwise, I will get reddish brown precipitate. Now, if I continue to add sodium hydroxide, the precipitate remains. So we say it is insoluble in excess. Then he says to the second portion, I added aqueous ammonia. Again, I'm adding aqueous ammonia to iron 3. It gives the same thing. So it will give reddish brown precipitate insoluble in excess. To the third portion of solution T, one centimeter cubed of dilute nitric acid followed by a few drops of aqueous silver nitrate were added. Again, you're going to ask yourself, silver nitrate is test for what? You should know that silver nitrate is test for chloride, bromide, iodide. What do we have? We have chloride. So you should remember that chloride will give white precipitate. If it were bromide, we would say cream precipitate. Iodide would give yellow precipitate. Now, to the fourth portion of solution T, one centimeter cubed of dilute nitric acid followed by a few drops of aqueous barium nitrate. You ask yourself, barium nitrate is test for what? You should realize that barium nitrate is test for sulfate. Do I have sulfate? If I have sulfate, I'm supposed to get white precipitate, but I don't have sulfate. I have iron 3 chloride. I don't have any sulfate. So when I add barium nitrate, there is no change. Then this last question says, catalysts are substances which increase the rate of a reaction, but are unchanged at the end of the reaction. Aqueous hydrogen peroxide decomposes slowly to form water and oxygen. So hydrogen peroxide, if you leave it alone, it decomposes slowly to form water and oxygen. Copper oxide is an insoluble solid. Plan an investigation to find out if copper oxide is a catalyst for this reaction. You must include how your results will tell you if copper oxide is a catalyst. You have access to copper oxide, aqueous hydrogen peroxide, and all normal laboratory apparatus. Again, remember, this is the question at the end of paper 6. It has 6 marks. Please explain in detail and uh, in the right order. So what do we do first? I want to know if copper oxide is a catalyst. So basically, what should I do? I should have this kind of apparatus. I put the hydrogen peroxide. I should do it once alone without copper oxide and once with the copper oxide in order to know if the copper oxide is a catalyst. Because if the copper oxide is a catalyst, then when I use it, I get more gas in the same amount of time. So what should we do? First, we need to measure a specific amount of hydrogen peroxide. So let us say 25 centimeter cubed of hydrogen peroxide using a pipette. Now I'm going to put into a flask connected to a gas syringe. So I'm going to put it into the dropping funnel, open the dropping funnel, it comes into the flask connected to a gas syringe. Now determine the volume of gas collected in a specific time. So let us say in two minutes or in one minute or whatever. So usually we say in one minute or in two minutes. Then I should repeat it using the solid that I want to know if it's a catalyst. So I'm going to repeat using, I have to specify that I'm going to use the same volume of hydrogen peroxide, 
But now I'm going to add a specific amount of copper oxide, weigh it with a balance. So I weigh the five grams of copper oxide, put it into the 25 centimeter cube of hydrogen peroxide. Again, I measure what? The volume of gas collected in the same amount of time. If the copper oxide is a catalyst, then the volume of gas collected in two minutes should be higher when I'm using copper oxide. Then another method of knowing that this is a catalyst, remember that we said at the top here it's written and you should know that catalysts increase the rate of the reaction but are unchanged at the end of the reaction. So we weighed five grams of copper oxide at the beginning. I put it, it gives a lot of gas. So that means it's a catalyst. And then to make sure that it's a catalyst, I should filter the solution that is remaining, wash the residue with the distilled water. Remember, what would be the residue? The residue would be the copper oxide. Dry between filter papers and weigh it. It should be the same mass that I started with of copper oxide. So if I started with five grams, at the end, I still have the five grams of copper oxide. This shows that it is a catalyst. Okay, that's the end of this paper. I hope it was useful. Thank you for listening.